The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I am Daniel Curtis, president of the American Society of Cytopathology, and I'd like to welcome you to a special presentation, COVID-19 in the Cytology Lab, Do's and Don'ts. We're thrilled to have Dr. Stefan Pambuchian from the Loyola University Medical Center offer this uh, presentation to us today in accord uh, with what's going on in uh, society and in the public at large. Our uh, pandemic is uh, uh, affecting all of us. Uh, to introduce Dr. Um, Pambuchian is a distinct honor. He finished medical school with uh, uh, MD cum laude in 1983 from the Universal uh, University of Bucharest, uh, Carol uh, Davila Medical School. In 83 through 86, he did a residency in family practice at the University of Bucharest. And then uh, 86 to 89, he actually acted as a clinician, a family practitioner in a, a relatively Euro, uh, rural setting. Uh, but in 1990 through 95, he did an APCP residency and uh, hematopathology fellowship um, at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York. And then uh, he obviously saw the light. He, uh, in 95 through 96, he did a cytopathology fellowship at Johns Hopkins, working with our um, uh, friend and, and mentor, uh, Dr. Arizan, and then uh, Daddy Rosenthal and Doug Clark in conjunction with activity at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. Uh, in 96, he joined the University of Minnesota as an assistant professor and director of cytopathology, and then he uh, rose through the ranks until he was promoted to full professor in 2010. In 2012, he joined uh, the group at Loyola University Medical Center as director of Surge Path and then director of uh, anatomic pathology, and currently um, serves with uh, Dr. Ivo Wojcik as uh, vice chair for scientific activities and faculty advancement. Uh, Dr. Pambuchin is well known to all of us in cytopathology, a member of many societies beyond the ASC, including USCAP and IAC, the CAP and the PAP Society. He's an associate editor for Diagnostic Cytopathology and a section editor for JASC. Um, he's uh, received uh, two-time Teacher of the Year awards from uh, University of Minnesota and twice at Loyola, and he has a a bibliography that's extensive with over 200 published papers. Um, we'd like to welcome Dr. Pambuchin this afternoon to talk to you. Stefan? Yes, thank you, Dr. Curtis, for inviting me to present this uh, webinar and for your kind introduction. Good afternoon, and thank you for participating in our Hot Topic webinar hosted by the American Society of Cytopathology. I realize that this is indeed a hot topic and I don't have all the answers to the questions that we have about coronavirus, the pandemic, or our role in it. But hopefully my brief review of the topic will stimulate a discussion that will help get us some answers, even if only preliminary. I will first go over the general aspects of the coronavirus epidemic. And then uh, we will go through some polling questions and then I will go over what I believe would be our at our role in uh, during these times. So let me start by uh, um, giving a short uh, COVID-19 timeline. So this epidemic probably started in the beginning of December uh, 2019, which is why it's called COVID-2019, which means coronavirus uh, infection uh, and 19. And as you can see in this picture, uh, all these coronaviruses seem to be uh, coming from various animals and the ones that affect uh, humans are from bats, but through the intermediaries of various um, animals. Um, the SARS coronavirus was through the intermediary of a civet, and it appears that the current SARS coronavirus 2 is through the intermediate of a pangolin, which 
is also called a scaly anteater, and it's a critically endangered animal, but um, it's a, the most trafficked animal in the world. It's the only mammal that has scales, and those scales are considered to be having healing power in a traditional Chinese medicine, which is uh, probably why 100,000 of these animals are trafficked every year, despite the fact that it's illegal to uh, sell them. At any rate, uh, when you are looking at this picture, you also realize that just a month ago, we were all, or some of us were at the USCAP meeting. Uh, we were um, there, we met uh, thousands of people, and um, we were at the uh, polls, and um, we were crowding together without any, um, um, you know, protection. And yet, as far as I know, we didn't get sick, although I had to count my days since I came to um, see if we are still within the incubation period, and I think we are not any longer. So let's go to the pandemic itself. Um, this is a very alarming, um, the rising, uh, both the rate of new cases and the rate of deaths, and even more alarming is the fact that the daily death count in the last few days is over 3,000. And just as a, uh, for a comparison, um, the normal, quote-unquote, seasonal flu also is a lot of victims, but the daily, the daily uh, victim count is uh, at best between 800 and uh, 1,500. So it's much lower and it's for a much shorter duration of time. And uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, websites that give you a lot of information about coronavirus, uh, number of cases, number of deaths. In here, there is from the Weather Channel, which I didn't know, but it's owned by IBM, and it gives daily updates on both the na national and the state-by-state -state number of coronavirus cases and deaths. We are all practicing social distancing these days, and um, this picture just shows you that social distancing was practiced even in the last century or last centuries. And um, as a fashion uh, statement, uh, you couldn't get very close to a woman with a crinoline because that itself was probably six feet across. So, uh, but at this at this point, we. Um, are having a patchwork of measures that are different from state to state and city to city, but they usually include cancelling sports, musical and cultural, and even political events, closing of gyms, schools and colleges, and recommendations to work from home, avoid discretionary travel, avoid eating and drinking in bars, restaurants and food courts, and avoid social gatherings in groups of more than 10 people. Um, and many of us think that this is an un unprecedented thing and uh, we all are saying to everybody to stay at home. This is from Loyola and everybody keep holds on on um, signs that show doing our part to save lives. So do your part by staying home. I am not in these pictures because I was doing my part and was staying home at the time that this picture was taken. At any rate, it's, this situation is not really unprecedented, although we all feel like that because the precedent was more than 100 years ago, the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic had uh, all these measures uh, instituted, but unfortunately in a very different way in different places when for different times. So in here you can see that in Chicago, at least at the time, there were still open uh, theaters, and um, they also had uh, the schools still open and churches open, and they asked them to stay with their windows open to allow air, cir air circulation, as if that would be the uh, answer to an influenza pandemic. At any rate, um, 
they also were wearing masks and uh, there were uh, pamphlets that were giving pretty good advice. And um, there were also signs that uh, were uh, a misinformation as they are now. This one was saying that the patriotic drive against the flu is to eat more onions. Um, obviously, the only way that eating onions would keep away the flu is that it actually um, makes social distancing very applicable because of the smell that the onions may have. Um, people were wearing masks and um, it says that the gauze mask is 99% proof against influenza, which obviously is not true, but uh, it was good that they thought about it that way. Um, the um, as you can see, everybody was wearing masks, and quarantine was also instituted. And there is a short history of quarantine. This is um, apparently originated in a maritime republic city state of Ragusa, uh, which is um, today called Dubrovnik in Croatia. And in 1377, they um, have the first uh, officially issued quarantine, which applied of the obligation of people and goods from ships arriving from plague-affected areas to stay 30 days on an uninhabited island. As you can see, to be purified by the sun and the wind. Later, this 30 days became a 40-day quarantine, and quarantine comes from 40 days, which is quarantina giorni in Italian. And... The, why 40 days? Apparently because Hippocrates uh, thought that that's the cutoff point between an acute and a chronic disease. And also because um, the 40 days was the time that Jesus spent in the wilderness and it's considered um, a time of spiritual purification. Did it work? Not really. Um, but um, it didn't work because... Braguza needed to survive um, and it, it depended on trade and uh, quarantine didn't help that at all. So it had to open its ports and, and um, obviously a plague came in. So how about uh, the impact of social distancing on the mortality during the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic? Well, as you can see in here, um, the, the unfortunate uh, uh, thing was that the pandemic occurred at the end of World War I and uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, patriotic events organized like this um, rally that had 200,000 people on the streets of Philadelphia. And unfortunately, um, 4,500 4, of all, uh, people died in the end of that week. And uh, the graph next to it uh, shows that uh, the Philadelphia had a very uh, a peak that was very sharp. And, but it, it, it uh, you know, uh, it was a briefer peak. But on the other hand, the, the dotted line is for St. Louis, which had uh, a very... Uh, a longer uh, peak, but much less um, sharp. So the difference is that St. Louis uh, had implemented fast and, and uh, far-reaching uh, social distancing measures, and Philadelphia did not. So we now call this flattening the curve, and it, it actually, in a, in a um, 1918 pandemic, it does not, not only flatten the curve, but led to a 30 to 50 percent lower mortality in cities that had taken early and prolonged social distancing measures. So, unfortunately, these days there are uh, a lot of uh, mathematical models that are pretty alarming. Uh, the one that I'm having here on the right is a uh, prediction from the Imperial College COVID-19 response team from London, which 
would uh, uh, speculate or says that on the, their mathematical model, there would be 2.2 million deaths in the United States uh, if in an unmitigated epidemic. I think that these numbers are highly over um, estimated, and I will show you why. These mathematical models are based on two things, on the basic reproductive number and the case fatality rate. And both of these are highly overestimated um, at this point. The R0 or R0 is the number of, of cases that are directly generated by each individual that is infected. So basically, if it, the uh, graph that you're seeing in here is when two, um, the, the, the number would be two, so two, uh, one infected person infects two, the, the two of them infect each one, two, and so on, and uh, um, this would be an R0 of two. The important thing is that R num R0 numbers over one indicate the propensity of infection to spread and cause, cause an epidemic, whereas R0 numbers less than one indicate that the infection is likely to die out. Um, in the right side of the uh, slide, you can see that previous, um, the known R0 numbers are very high for so-called childhood diseases like chickenpox and measles, which have very high numbers, and reasonably low for, for uh, other coronavirus infections like MERS. Um, and the um, SARS epidemic had... Uh, are zero numbers of between two and five, but again, if you are looking at this from a different perspective, these numbers were much lower, probably, but were reinflated by the fact that a lot of healthcare workers uh, became sick, um, and in hospitals, the R zero numbers was more like fourteen than like two. So. The mathematical model, as I said before, is also based on a case fatality rate, and that rate is the total number of new deaths due to the disease divided by the total number of incident patients with this disease. And unfortunately, this total number of incident patients is highly underreported because the only uh, cases that are tested are the people who have pretty severe diseases. And um, although everybody says that uh, the case fatality rate is about 2% and it's similar in China, Iran, and Italy, it varies between 0 0.225 and 3%, and the lower estimates may be closer to the true value. Okay, then also COVID-19 case fatality rates are highly dependent on the age of the population and this is data from China, and it shows that in eight uh, patients over 80, the case fatality rate is really high, whereas in uh, very young patients, it's very low, uh, but obviously just as unacceptable. In here, uh, there is uh, um, another uh, way of showing this data, and you can see that uh, men seem to have a much higher death rate than women and that patients with coexistent diseases like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, chronic respiratory diseases, hypertension, and cancer have much higher death rates than patients without. The mode of transmission of this virus is through close contact, contact with droplet type of um, respiratory um, transmission. So the droplets are inhaled or they're sprayed on a susceptible individual who gets sick, and but they also can act through, uh, through surfaces and from the airborne uh, transmission, the, the virus will stay on the surface and then will either be evaporated, resuspended and inhaled, or the Another person will touch the surface and will touch the nose or other parts of the face, 
and will become infected. Uh, this would be the fomite type of spread, and because the virus is found in the feces, there may also be a fecal oral transmission, and it is possible that the uh, virus is also transmitted by small droplet or aerosol type of transmission. Um, but what we know, which is good, is that there is no intrauterine transmission to the fetus, and um, the, all the placentas and feti that have been tested are all negative from women with this virus. The viral entry is through a receptor that is the ACE2, the, um, the, um, the uh, receptor, and there is also a, a helping uh, a molecule that, that seems to be activating this, and so uh, there are a lot of uh, attempts to target either one of these two uh, molecules, but at this point, I, it would be too early to say that any of them is successful. So uh, this is a nice uh, uh, immunostain showing the virus uh, positive cell between um, negative cells of the ciliated cells of the respiratory tract. And uh, this is a picture from the backyard of Dr. Syed Ali that he posted on Twitter a few days ago and I think it's a very nice way of looking at the nature from your backyard because now we have time to do so, we are frequently at home. Uh, the manifestations of COVID-19, the symptoms usually start with fever, chills, sweat, sweating, malaise and muscle pain and this is followed by a dry cough and if the infection is severe enough, after a week, there is shortness of the breath, which in 20% of the patients leads to their hospitalization. Uh, less common symptoms are runny nose, sneezing, and sore throat, and gastrointestinal symptoms. And even rarer are the loss of smell and the loss of taste. Um, the incubation period is, the mean incubation period is between three and five days, but the range is two to 14, and the raw outliers up to 27 days. The symptoms um, last for about two weeks if in mild cases. They could be lasting for three to six weeks in severe or critical cases. And um, usually if, if uh, severe disease, disease develops, it develops within one week of the start of the symptoms. The shedding is pretty long, and the median is 20 days, but it uh, can last to up to 37 days. And patients who die of the disease are shedding virus up to the end. And um, how do we differentiate this from the common cold and the flu? Well, um, as I was saying before, all of them have similar symptoms, but... Breathlessness is a symptom that is pretty uh, convincingly not either flu or common cold. And having upper um, respiratory tract symptoms would be an argument against COVID-19. How certain is the clinical diagnosis of COVID-19? And we don't know that, but um, there's a paper about uh, um, diagnostic difficulties in SARS in patients, and it's about 14 patients who had died and undergone autopsy, all of them had either diagnosed SARS or suspected of SARS. And in autopsy, they confirmed SARS only in eight of these cases, meaning 57%. And in the other ones, there were other uh, lung infections that were considered to be SARS, but were not. And the clinical differential diagnosis was very wide, wide and it included viral pneumonia and other pneumonias, studies asthmaticus, sepsis, and even acute myocardial infarction. How about laboratory tests? Uh, how frequently do we detect this virus in different um, samples? As you can see in here, the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, although the least commonly used, or one of the less commonly used samples is 93% uh, sensitive for this um, virus, whereas 
other samples, including nasal swabs, sputum, are about 60-70%, and um, blood is only 1%, and pharyngeal swabs are only 30%, and about the same amount in, uh, can be found in feces. They didn't find, find any in urine, but um, in SARS patients they did, so I'm not sure that uh, it's impossible to find it there. What are the pathologic findings in patients who um, have had biopsies or most likely they had an autopsy? Um, the, the findings are mostly those of ARDS or diffuse alveolar damage and or organizing pneumonitis. There can be widespread uh, fibrin thrombi uh, because the patients may have disseminated intravascular coagulation and hemophagocytosis can be seen in these patients. Um, the um, pathology findings uh, are um, frequently alveolar edema. These are um, in patients that had resections uh, for um, lung cancer and had these findings in a tissue adjacent to the lung cancer. So um, there were interalveolar fibrin with organization. The infiltrate was usually infoplasmacytic. There were multinucleated giant cells, and the pneumocytes showed hyperplastic and reactive changes. And some of these uh, changes have been considered to suggest viral um, infection, but uh, none, nobody has actually seen good viral infection in these patients. Um, inclusion spinning. So the, there was an attempt to um, see what the uh, findings are in uh, non-human uh, uh, animals, and this is uh, experimental data showing that um, it, the infection seems to be starting with edema and um, then with um, neutrophils, uh, fibrin, and cell debris within the alveoli, and then uh, nuclear cells, syncytial cells, and the syncytia are not formed of histiocytic cells, but of, of epithelial cells, as can be seen in here by this immunistochemical chemical stain for keratin. And then the um, virus is localized in the uh, areas of alveolar damage and also in the mucous glands of the nasal cavity. These are also, again, uh, uh, autopsy findings, but this time from SARS. Um, the atypical pneumocytes in SARS are very unusual features, uh, multinucleation, very prominent nucleoli, sometimes extreme multinucleation, um, but um, they are not characteristic of, of SARS or of coronaviruses that can be seen in many other uh, viral infections. Where did the, did the SARS virus, um, where was it found in autopsy? Cases. Well, the lung tissues are 100%, uh, but uh, also in bowel samples, lymph nodes, spleen, liver, and kidney. And immunohistochemically, they found it in the epithelial cells of the trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles, and in the pneumocytes. And um, they found it in dusquamated pneumocytes and syncytial giant cells. They also found it in lymphocytes and in the intestinal mucosa epithelial cells and in the re renal tubules and in the neurons. So uh, this is uh, a slide that, that tries to figure out how we will, how this uh, epidemic will end. And according to these authors, it's either by developing immunity or by having a vaccine by viral evolution that would lead to strains that are less uh, um, um, strong and less infectious. Weather is always uh, spoken about, although there is very little evidence that weather actually works. 
and most importantly, containment. And this is what we are doing now. Another uh, word from Dr. Sayed Ali's backyard. And then we are going to try to figure out together what are the implications of this COVID-19 for the cytology laboratory. First of all, is, it, is the cytology laboratory useful in a diagnosis of COVID-19? And secondly, how can we continue to, to function during this epidemic? And thirdly, how can we continue to, to have our education role in the middle of this pandemic? And as I said before, I don't think I have all the answers, but maybe we can find them out together. And here is the time that we are going to start some polling questions, and I hope that the audience will participate in them. Um, Joanne, please, can you start the polls? The first poll is up. Does your laboratory receive cytology samples from suspected or confirmed COVID-19 patients? I'll give you a few few seconds here to put your responses in. Yeah. We have about 46% voted so far. We'll give it another couple of seconds here. I'm going to close the poll and I will results. You had 49% that said no or not yet. 5% that's no, we don't accept them. 23% yes, and we have handled them routinely. 25% yes, but we handle them separately. Okay, next poll, yep. please. Next one. Yes. You're continuing to offer pathologists performed FNAs at your institution. Go ahead. And Okay, I'm closing the poll. I'll share the results to this one. 29% said yes routinely. 42% yes selectively. 29% said no. This sounds like an even split. You want me to continue with your polls? Please, yes. The next question. Are you continuing to offer rapid on-site evaluations by cytotechnologists, trainees, or pathologists. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. 48% said yes routinely, 35% said yes selectively, 16% said no. Okay, can you go to the next poll, please? Do the providers use full personal protective equipment, including N95 mask, respirators, face shield, gown, and gloves? I'm going to close your poll. 
23% said yes routinely, 60% said yes sometimes, some combination of PPE, 17% said no. Next question. Yes, please. Did you make any changes to your routine cytology procedures, including bronchiopulmonary cytology? I'm going to close the poll. 73% said no. 4% said yes. We abandoned air dry Rom Romanowski stain smears. 3% yes, we abandoned all direct smears, only make cell blocks. 20% yes, changes not mentioned above. And our last question. Do you use virtual online sessions to sign out with or to lecture the trainees, residents, fellows, or cited technology students? Close our poll. Yes, only for sign out. 27% yes, only for lectures. 24% yes, both sign out and lectures. 38% no, we do not use any online platform. Okay, so I think that. Thank you very much for uh, these polls and for participating in them. I think that what we have um, seen is that there are a variety of approaches to this and they differ from um, place to place, but um, they um, many institutions seem to be using online um, teaching in some way or another and uh, most institutions seem not to have made much changes, many changes to their usual routine procedures. Um, let's uh, review some of the Twitter polls. Um, do we have or uh, anticipate having a shortage of PP in your institution? Again, these are very few votes, but they show that basically almost half and half, they do or they do not. Um, do they, uh, do people disinfect their slides before looking at them under the microscope? And again, most people don't. And um, how frequently uh, do we keep in touch with laboratory staff um, regarding COVID-19 updates? And you can see that a lot of people have uh, once a day or twice a day, but some people have less. And do you sign out with uh, trainees in the same room under multi-headed scope? Mostly no. Do you anticipate cytology staff redeployment to other areas? Uh, and many uh, people think that they are going to be redeployed in uh, within the lab, some people within patient care, and some no. Let's see how useful uh, respiratory tract cytology would be in uh, COVID-19 patients. This is one of the, I mean, it's the only paper that has been published to date about uh, BAL in a COVID-19 patient, and it shows that this patient at least had a, a very significant uh, uh, plasma cytosis in the in a BAL, and the plasma cells were polyclonal. Uh, there also uh, 
what the authors thought are into nuclear cytopathic inclusions. I'm not sure if they are, but uh, certainly that would be an interesting feature. This is from uh, Twitter, and um, because we didn't have any uh, other uh, images of these uh, PALs in, in this category of patients, it shows very reactive-looking pneumocytes and maybe a cytopathic effect. Um, there is another uh, 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 Twitter uh, contribution which shows in a Romanovsky type stain a very unusual looking uh, cell that may be a uh, plasmacytoid lymphocyte or according to the author maybe a type 2 pneumocyte that may be similar to the one described within a influenza pandemic. And we, looking back at what happened during the SARS epidemic, uh, there were uh, some uh, BALs examined, and this is a paper from Hong Kong from Gary Tse, and they show that there were uh, clusters of, of uh, um, macrophages, uh, vacuolation or, or multivacuolation of macrophages, multinucleation of macrophages, and ground glass appearance of the nucleus, all changes that are very non-specific. So the conclusion is that cytology has limited utility in the management of patients with known or sus suspected COVID-19. But it may be useful in two circumstances. Either you're, we are trying to diagnose a superimposed infection, which occurs frequently in the end stages of, of um, this disease, and such infectious organisms may be diagnosed faster on, uh, on cytology than microbiologically. And or the creation is uncertain about uh, if this really is COVID-19. And in these type of cases, uh, there may be some clues that would be helping clinical uh, decision making because other potential uh, Disease like status asthmaticus would have eosinophils, pneumonias would have neutrophils, and cardiac failure would have hemocidal and later macrophages, and that is different than the lymphoplasmacytic cells that are usually seen in patients with this infection. Should we perform uh, cytology um, on respiratory samples routinely? And in my opinion, um, we should discuss this with our co clinical colleagues because uh, I believe that in light of the fact that it's not very useful, we should just do it if clinical judgment um, says that it will be useful for um, um, clinical decision-making. Again, a uh, little bird from Dr. Syed Ali's backyard, and it's a beautiful one. I don't know what the name of it is, but clearly um, it enjoys our sheltering at home. How do we function during these times of social distancing? And first of all, we need to keep safe. So use safe laboratory practices. And these are nothing new. They should be used always, but all the personnel should be trained in use of protective equipment. The access to a laboratory should be limited and actually as much as possible, only one person should be present. Uh, frequent hand washing and, wear, and wearing of personal protective equipment. Avoid touching um, mucosal membranes of eyes, nose and mouth decontaminate all work surfaces, including benches, computer keyboards, phones, and, and other frequently touched areas of the microscope. Um, use universal precaution when dealing with any cytology specimen because we don't know which one is coming from, from a COVID-19 patient. Special precautions should be taken handling specimens the preparation of which involves steps that can lead to aerosol formation, and that's basically a lot of different things. Expelling aspirates from a syringe, 
smearing the aspirated material, air drying or heat drying the smear. And these are frequently things that are done during rows or rapid on-site evaluation. So should we do rapid on-site evaluation, given the fact that we have all these steps that in, could theoretically uh, give rise to aerosol formation? And yes, but it should only be done in cases in which is absolutely necessary. And with appropriate personal protective equipment. And that involves uh, everything, including the N95 respirators. And since these are in uh, short supply, I think that most institutions would prefer not to have pathologists do on-site evaluations during these times. Uh, how about FNAs? Should we suspend the activity of FNAs that we are done in our, in our own FNA clinics that are run by pathologists. Um, and I think that routine ones should be suspended and only um, performing FNAs on a case-by-case -case basis, weighing the risks and benefits for, the, for each patient. Because again, a lot of steps done during this involve steps that could lead to aerosolization of the virus. How about fixatives and virus inactivation? So we know that formalin inactivates the virus and all alcohols over 70% do so. But we don't know if cytolite inactivates the virus because it's only 25% methanol. We don't know if surepath fixative inactivates the virus because it's about 24% ethanol, 1% methanol, 1% isopropanol. And these are all uh, secret, quote-unquote, uh, uh, reagents, and again, we don't know what what the percentage of methanol is in a diff-quick fixative, but it's probably less than 70%. How about PPE? If you look at these pictures from China, you see that there is no part of the skin exposed in these uh, individuals trying to perform an autopsy. Um, so extreme adherence to um, to a PP is very important if you want to keep healthcare workers uh, safe. N95 marks get their name because they are not resistant to oil and they have an efficiency level of the filter of at least 95%. And they need to be fit testing, meaning that you need to check on the seal that the respirator gives. And from this paper, I was I found out that surgical masks are primarily designed for to protect the environment from the wearer, whereas respirators or N95 masks are supposed to protect the wearer from the environment. This is very important because of the news that you're hearing that uh, you should wear surgical masks that only would protect other people, not you. And in here, you can see that they tested two surgical masks from the same manufacturer and the tremendous uh, difference in um, penetration rate of some um, you know, uh, some variants. One had 20% and one had 84% penetration rate. So at any rate, it's too much for really uh, feeling uh, safe with such a mask if you use it to protect yourself. Hand washing, again, there is an advantage to hand washing and the study from Finland shows that there was a 6.7% reduction of infection episode, especially respiratory infections. And this was done during the uh, 2009 influenza pandemic. And interestingly enough, uh, hand hygiene with soap and water was efficient, but not hand rubbing with alcohol-based uh, disinfectants. And avoid touching your face is a very good advice, but it's very difficult to keep because... Uh, apparently, people are um, touching their mouth or nose or other uh, parts of the face three times per hour, and it would be very difficult to wash with that frequency. Um, again, a picture from the backyard of Dr. Ali. And then, um, so what can we do during this uh, pandemic? One of the important things is to communicate with one another and provide up-to-date information 
uh, about what the most recent developments in our knowledge about the disease, uh, uh, provide information about uh, the jobs, provide emotional support, communicate effectively the risk to laboratory personnel and trainees, and then um, about teaching, again, we have canceled all of the educational sessions like grand rounds, lectures, journal clubs, and so on, and limited face-to-face -face activities, and we don't sign up together with our residents any longer. Um, but so we uh, use online lectures and use an uh, unknown session using either digitized images or using one of the... Um, online platforms and again this we have to make sure that all trainees have the access to te to these technologies even from home so they have a microphone they have a, a, a you know computer and we should identify teaching teachable moments in our daily work and share them with our trainees we should give them brief teaching points many assignments many quizzes and encourage so um, directed learning. Again, I uh, will end with showing that the ASC is trying to do its part in, in keeping everybody, um, you know, trained and, and taught. And again, this these are um, the free live online education series of the ASC. And they will start with Dr. Pantano, which is soft tissue pathology, continue with um, Dr. Barkan's urine cytology, and Dr. Siddiqui's pancreatic final respiration, and Dr. Ali's thyroid. And there will be more of them, and they will be every week. And I would like to thank everybody for their attention, and I would like to uh, now try to answer some questions. And this is the picture that is, was taken by Dr. Barkan, and it shows that we will pass this bridge to if we are together and we are keeping safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm sure that uh, we'll all use a lot of those images that you presented to us. Um, we'd like to ask the audience now if you have any questions, um, you, know, you can type them in and uh, Dr. Pambuchian um, will uh, um, uh, respond to you. I would like you also to know that there are two handouts in association with this talk. Dr. Pambuchian has recently published a paper, The COVID-19 Pandemic Implication for the Cytology Laboratory in JASC, and that's there for your download. Also, um, there's a PDF handout of uh, his presentation. Um, while we're waiting for questions, I would also like to note that this uh, um, educational series, which will continue through June um, on a weekly basis, was put together by Dr. Gulis Barkan uh, from Loyola. She is our uh, president-elect and has done a yeoman service, uh, especially trying to help out our cytotechnology students whose clinical rotation they're being affected by uh, this event, uh, this pandemic, and uh, similarly for our, our pathology residents and cytopathology fellows. And while we're waiting for questions to occur, um, Stefan, have you had any um, uh, people rotated out of your laboratory or uh, asked by uh, infectious disease groups or uh, within your institution to transfer people over? Because we've personally seen a 50% a, a drop in cytologies at the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene. And we do have plans for cross-training and backup with uh, um, other man, uh, mandated areas in our laboratory like newborn screening and infectious disease. Uh, we did not yet, but I think that there was a call for uh, uh, volunteers for these type of activities. And I think that given the fact that our activity has been reduced pretty significantly, I think that that would be a reasonable thing. Again, depending on each person's abilities and willingness to do so. 
Um, we did not have it yet. So I'm seeing a question in here. Or can anybody read the questions? Yes, I can I'm read you the question. question. Go for it. For study cytology prep lab, we, where we prepare monolayer cell slides, thin prep, what PPE and universal precautions is recommended? I think that according to the CDC, you should wear the uh, full uh, PPE, including a respirator, um, an N95 mask. Uh, whether that is possible or not is another question because the CDC has also given us uh, instructions for what to do when we don't have them. So uh, I am, my personal opinion is that we should all have them. Uh, I mean, everybody who is dealing with fresh samples that are not fixed should wear uh, full protection, including face shields and masks. Any other question? Next question. Is N95 required or can we use level one mask and face shield? I'm not sure what level one means exactly, but uh, it's depending on the availability in that hospital because a lot of hospitals have very limited availability of N95 masks. Ours has introduced a new master is called KN95, which is made in China, but has the same um, um, characteristics as the N95 mask. And I'm assuming that um, depending on the availability, we should try to wear the N95, but whatever it is that we can. I have one question here. Um, uh, it seemed that someone had submitted, it seems that a lot of testing facilities have recently been able to start putting out the results due to a variety of delays in, in getting uh, testing set up, training, and troubleshooting. Um, could the apparent jump in the number of cases be a result of all these results coming through at the same time and not truly represent the rate of spread of infection? I think that that's a really good uh, question. I think it's correct. But I think that the jump in this cannot be attributed to more testing. So we had more than 500 uh, deaths in the, uh, in the United States from yesterday, from the day before yesterday to, to, to today. So basically, uh, in one day, more than 500 deaths is a lot of uh, deaths, and that is not related to testing. Well, Any other uh, questions? Let's see, I don't have another question, but um, you know, we at the State Public Laboratory in Wisconsin got the early test and there was a problem um, with the first test with uh, the, the primers. And after uh, we had too many uh, false positives, then the CDC provided another test that, that uh, um, uh, was much better. And we've been doing uh, four to 500 uh, a day working seven days a week, uh, but that's inadequate. And luckily now our local institutions have come online and we are seeing uh, a, a huge uh, number of, of tests being done um, by mm -hmm. academic sites, by uh, private labs. Um, and some companies like Exact Sciences and whatnot are also uh, putting and and Abbott are putting forth other methodologies that should really improve our ability to do the testing. China and I uh, gave the reference at the time, but I will try to find it right now and uh, give it again. So, in that paper that is from the CDC from China, the Beijing Laboratory um, is giving the 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 percent positivity in different specimens from patients who with confirmed um, I'm sorry I have trouble in finding my own slide which is 
it so it's uh, from 205 patients with COVID-19 from the National Institute for Viral Diseases Control and Prevention in China. Um, and the paper is from the JAMA in, and I have a DOI in here. And so um, if anybody wants to, um, can send me an email and I will send them the reference exactly. But this paper is, is showing you the percent of positivity in different specimens and the BAL at the 93%, and the other ones have much lower percentages. So that's where that number is coming from. Any other question, please? Uh, hang on one second. How does the COVID compare with H1N1? Well, H1N1 had a much higher infectivity rate, or an R0, but the um, case mortality rate or case fatality rate was very low. It was 0, 0.0 something. So it was less than 0.1%. So I think that that is definitely much lower than, than in this epidemic. And that is why we have sailed through that epidemic rather unscathed. Any other question? Uh, is it wise to examine air-dried slides stained with DIFQIC by the pathologist next door to the FNA suite? As I was saying, I, I have no information about the fixative that uh, is a proprietary fixative. I couldn't find the amount of alcohol it has. I'm sure it has less than 70% alcohol, which is the one that we are usually using as a disinfectant for these viruses. So I'm not sure that uh, I can be give a good answer, and I don't think anybody has it. Any other question? Yes. Is there fact scheduling, and is cytology attending EBIS procedures for staging and diagnosis? I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. It says, is your faculty still scheduling and is cytology attending EBUS procedure for staging and diagnosis? I think that we should ask Dr. Barkan this question because I don't know exactly. I am actually online with you here. Uh, so far, um, after the uh, COVID uh, has been evident, um, our EBUS physicians have been canceling the uh, and talking to them unless they really, really need it, they won't do it themselves and they definitely don't want the uh, cytopathologist doing the rapid on-site evaluation um, uh, on the spot. Uh, although we are not in the same room as them, they still don't want to do them as much as possible. Uh, there are a couple more questions, uh, Dr. Pambuchan, that I could see. Um, okay. One question is, uh, does preserve sites deactivate uh, the virus with cytoprep techniques? I, as I was saying before, I think the preserved site is the sure path uh, uh, fixative, and we don't know, but it's only 25% alcohol, so probably not. But we can, I can tell because nobody has, has actually done that, including the manufacturer that uh, has not tried it out, so I'm not sure that it, I can answer that question. Uh, another question is about, do you disinfect the slides? Do you wear gloves? I personally don't, but I think it would be a good idea. I have a box of gloves in my office now. And um, I don't disinfect slides because they would take away the dots in cytology at least. In such paths, it's possible to disinfect them. And I think that uh, an ordinary alcohol wipe would surface, but... I don't uh, do it right now. I'm sure that I will do it more because we are getting more and more scared by the day of what this means. Mm -hmm. Another question is about men with beards who are not fitted for N95s. Uh, what is our recommendation for them regarding the, uh, the hoods? Uh, dispose or disinfect with alcohol to wear or not to wear any kind of masks? 
I think that um, the answer is pretty much uh, that it depends on if the person uh, prizes their health it's more than they prize the, the uh, beard. <laughs> so I think that the beard should be adjusted so that it fits under the mask. At least those are the CDC guidelines. In our institution, they make people with facial hair wear the uh, uh, pepper, which have a, a, uh, an air circulation uh, device attached. Okay, well, that's another possibility. But again, these possibilities are only going to be there until we are running out of those devices. And absolutely. Uh, another, nasal swabs are, are one of our big problems to have enough of those, but that's for another talk. Any other uh, questions? Question. There's a couple more questions if you don't mind staying on for them. Um, are there any special precautions you would recommend when disposing of large volume body fluids? Disposing of them? Disposing of them. According to the CDC, we shouldn't do anything specifically different about disposing um, specimens of any sort because we already are disposing them in a very, um, um, you know, the good way, meaning that they are not going to contaminate the environment. Mm -hmm. mm, a couple of questions. Um, have you seen a drop in volume or reduction with your routine procedures? And we sort of talked about that a little bit, but um, what is your thought on that? I think that all of us have seen it because uh, almost all hospitals have implemented um, no procedures that are not immediately needed should be performed during this time, including no endoscopies and so on. So I think that procedures are down and so are our specimens. Yes, totally agreed with that. Um, another question is, um, for those currently performing FNAs in, in their um, laboratories, and say, for instance, they have fellows or cytotechnologists, uh, doing the rapid on site evaluation, is it enough to wear the surgical mask or should they wear N95s? So, as I said, um, in general, if the procedure or whatever you're attending it poses a threat to the person doing it, N95 is the preferred uh, mask. Uh, the other ones, surgical masks, as they are called, are more uh, uh, to protect the patients from you rather than you from the patient. So I would recommend the 95 uh, uh, respirators for everybody who is dealing with specimens or patients who have or could have COVID-19. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We're good. I think so. There are other questions too, but we're kind of running uh, low on time. Um, and one of the things we can do is possibly reach out to um, whoever was on the webinar if they still have questions. They ask us to show the slide with the lectures from the ASC, so I can do that. But right. I, yes. I, okay, so sorry, I will. And, and Guli should address this because she's. Uh, she has organized this. Yeah, sure, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. So for everybody who's uh, still on and still listening, uh, first of all, thank you all very much for joining in on this. Um, if you have further questions, uh, please reach out to us um, via Ms. Jenkins, Joanne Jenkins, and we'll be able to try and answer your questions as much as we can. We'll forward it on to Dr. Pambushan. So that's one. Uh, secondly, uh, we know this is difficult times and um, our educational sessions have been interrupted since we can't all be sitting in the one room. And this is true really all over the world. Uh, so the ASC leadership has uh, come up with this free uh, online educational series, which is going to be happening uh, starting tomorrow 
and it will happen on a weekly basis where we will have one of our faculty uh, give an unknown session um, over the um, online session uh, on the internet and uh, you'll be able to ask questions like you've done today and you'll be able to see all these interesting cases. Um, the way to sign up for this is again, um, either uh, follow the links that you've been sent and any of you who have joined in today, um, uh, we hope that you'll be joining in on our sessions, on our free uh, educational sessions. Uh, but you can also go on to our uh, website um, where you can see um, the uh, weekly content uh, as well as you can register. Uh, this slide only shows what's happening in April, uh, but we have it really going all the way until the end of June. So we have a session uh, every week. Uh, and again, ask us any questions that you might want and... Um, We'll see uh, how can we help you. So it's going to be advertised on Twitter too? Yes, it's on, it's on email, it's on Facebook, it's on our website, cytopathology.org. So hope everybody could join. And um, most of these uh, talks have, are from members of our executive board, and they will be um, in video microscopy tutorial format, or uh, some may be in lecture format, but again, it's uh, especially directed at uh, trainees who are having their uh, educational uh, sessions interrupted by the current pandemic. And so uh, if there is anything else that you would like to see that is reasonable, um, our society will uh, attempt to help. So, um, wrapping up, I want to thank again uh, Dr. Panvuchin for this uh, wonderful presentation, a wonderful timely presentation, and uh, this is recorded, will be available at other times from our website, and so um, we'd like to wish you a, a good afternoon and stay safe. Wash thank your hands. Thank you everybody for listening to us. And be safe. And be safe. Absolutely.